This is Jeffrey Tucker of the Leslie Fair Club, and I'm here today with Joel Bowman, who is the editor of The Daily Reckoning, and he is also the gentleman who wrote the introduction to our new edition of The Market for Liberty by the Tannehills. Welcome, Joel. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. Well, I don't know if our connection's going to hold up. We're, um, we're, we're a very long way away from each other. You're in Argentina today, but it seems like it's doing okay, so um, we'll keep it brief, maybe just to preserve the clarity of this, uh, of our current connection, which is wonderful. And you're excited about our new release of a book, of uh, the Tannehill book, right? I am excited about it, and uh, for a number of reasons, actually. I mean, I'm excited about the Laissez-Faire Club in general. Uh, oh, it's, it's a wonderful idea. I mean, you know, this this new fully digitalized book club um, where a new one of these you know fantastic e books is is landing in members um, inbox and in their possession every Friday it's it's, it's a revolutionary thing and uh, I can't speak highly enough about it but in particular this book uh, I'm very very excited about Morrison and Tannehill's uh, market for liberty um, for me it was a rather important book um, just in my own sort of path toward um, voluntarism and, by extension, anarchism, um, I'd sort of seen that, that previous to this, most of the arguments were a little bit, a little bit stuffy, kind of academic, kind of philosophical. And what the Ten Hills did is they really grounded it with some practical applications and examples of not necessarily how things should look in a free market, of course, because there's no ought to in a free market, um, but how things might look and how particular problems uh, that the status opposition to uh, um, pure freedom um, um, might look. And, and so this was kind of important um, in, in my own um, uh, philosophical sort of evolution and I was, I was delighted and honored to be able to um, be part of the, the book going forward. Well, now the book was written in the 1970s, a time when hardly, when very few people were contemplating anarchism. But as you said, the, the particular problems that in those days were very much alive. Uh, for example, it was written during the Cold War. So everybody right. was very concerned about issues of security. I mean, we needed government in those days to be the night watchman. I mean, certainly to protect us against, you know, I mean, there was a time of, of threat. I mean, we, we believed that right. we were, we were and, under threat. And the, the, the key here being that we believed in government propaganda. And, and the, I mean, this is, this is the irony of it, is, is that the government convinces us that we need it. And then we, we use the reasoning of the government that, that, that the state has has foisted upon us to justify our own enslavement, which is, it, it's a very, very strange, I think, kind of uh, deranged way of, of looking at the world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I've, I've noted before in, in many Daily Reckoning columns that it's, it, it really is the height of a kind of mass political Stockholm syndrome, where we become so enamored uh, with our captors as to basically cheer our own enslavement. and. When people come along, like the like the Tanner Hills did in the Market for Liberty, and w with the message of, of, of emancipation, with the message of liberty, with with the this wonderful message of freedom, uh, you know, there, were, there was a pushback against this. And when we think about this through history, there always is a pushback against um, against these crazies on the fringe that are talking out against um, the, against the status quo and against uh, slavery. But, but what the Tannehills did is they basically drew the line in the sand and said, look, this, this is an issue for which you can be on only one side when it comes to a, a, a um, historical pers perspective. You're going to be on the right side of history or you are going to be on the slave owner's side of history. And, uh, you know, there, there really was no way back after this, so. Well, it was gigantically influential and, <clears throat> and yet a very low circulation book, I think, when it came out. I mean, I can't imagine there was more than 
really just a few hundred printed. I mean, if you think about it, this release today into the club has already probably um, quintupled the uh, the circulation of the book during its first ten years. <laughs> Right, you know, I was I was writing um, an introduction to the, to the um, to an essay uh, for this particular book for the the weekend edition of the Daily Reckoning, mm. and I kept trying to think, what would the Tannehills say about this? Um, you know, the the enormous uh, proliferation of of their very very important work um, here today. I mean, what would they think about the you know the concept of uh, compressing the cost of publicate uh, of publishing a book down to a, a zillionth of what it was, and just blasting it out to people all around the world who want to uh, learn about these very important ideas and who want to be uh, involved in the discussion of liberty going forward at a, at a particularly um, important time um, for us now. Uh, I'm in Argentina right now, but uh, for 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 the people living under all states everywhere. It's, That's it's, right. Incredibly important. We're all we're all we're all one nation now, the nation of liberty, I suppose you could say, or the nation of striving for liberty, you know. Yes, well one one would hope, surely. <laughs> it is interesting to think though that since the end of the Cold War, uh, nationalism is not what it was when they wrote this book, is it? Or maybe it's since the invention of the internet, or maybe it's both. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting uh, question. It's, it's it's a very interesting uh, discussion because, in many ways, we saw this kind of just blind um, sort of foolhardy nationalism, um, you know, towed along behind these huge propaganda machines of the state at the end and and eventually the collapse of the Cold War, um, and then we sort of that, saw that kind of peter out uh, in a way through the through the nineties. Um, when it was it was declared that it, you know this is a unipolar uh, world now and there's only one superpower and we have to have all trust in the superpower um, being the United States but when we think about this you know I mean this has basically set the stage for what would be Orwell's uh, absolute nightmare in that there is one version of right there is one version of correct and we all must be unquestioningly um, servile, you know, to this, uh, uh, to this, to this one nation world, um, and I think that's a very, very dangerous uh, path to 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 embark on. And um, you know, so I'm, I'm just very happy to to have these kinds of discussions. They're, they couldn't come at a more important time, especially with the advent of the internet and you know the huge um, um, readership rate. And, you know, internet penetration to all corners of the globe. I know, Jeffrey, you have subscribers to um, to your, your daily column from probably in Antarctica, but surely in six other continents and, you know, of all walks of life. And, you know, this is going back to what the Tannehills would experience when they first published their, their first few hundred um, copies in the first run. You know, this is something, this is an opportunity that we have now that they would only have, have dreamed of. Yeah. And you know, it's, it puts all the more um, onus on us to to take the ball and run with it from here. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Joel, for writing the introduction, for putting such a, a contemporary and human touch on the book, and for um, for agreeing to this little interview today. And we'll see you in the club forums. I hope very soon, where where the active discussion is already starting on this title.